All the way from Bokota Village in Limpopo, South Africa, we bring you Missionary Minds, where you can learn about family, church history, biblical worldview issues, and of course, missions, all from the mind of a real-world missionary of almost 20 years. But Paul's been a couple of weeks now, and we've had the blessing at Trinity of having our own ordained pastor, the first one at Trinity Baptist Church in Bokota. It's been such a, such a blessing that's been Reginald and Tuli, and it happened because of a very special occasion that took place, which was the ordination service. And even before the ordination service, there was an ordination exam, which you played a large part in designing, and we want to discuss and talk about that today. So uh, please speak to us about the ordination process and what goes into it. Over to you, Mfundisi. First, the story, 1790. Carl Rainius was born in Germany, and he was eventually a part of the Church Missionary Society, the CMS, and he really became one of the great missionaries, although unknown, Joseph Wolf, who is a great missionary in his own right, called Rainius perhaps the greatest Protestant missionary ever. Uh, Rainius served as a missionary in India for nearly 50 years, never took a furlough, and he was very influential in planting churches and primarily starting over 100 Christian schools. And his method of influence was getting a group of men, simply training them, uh, teaching them the Bible, and then sending them out to be evangelists themselves, but he ran into a problem that as he was training these men to be evangelists and teachers and preachers and pastors, according to the Anglican, that would be the Church of England method, in order for these men to be ordained and actually have some level of authority, they had to travel far away to whoever would be the bishop in this area in order to be recognized as a a pastor. And this just seemed totally unfeasible. And so Rainius resisted, and they put back, and he resisted, and they pushed back again. They said, look, in the end, if you don't like it, you can go to England and argue about it. And if you don't follow what we say, you're going to have to resign. And he was pressured, and so he finally said, okay, I'll go along with what you say. Well, the Indian evangelists were devastating. They said, please, you you can't insist on this happening. And so he changed his mind and he resigned as a part of the CMS. And he basically served as a missionary for the rest of his days without any kind of promised salary. And all of it revolved around the idea of ordination. So this brings up the question, uh, what is ordination? Why is it so important? How should ordination be done? Is ordination biblical? Are there passages that talk about ordination? And that's what we want to talk about today. Thank you for teeing it up for us, brother. And it is a very relevant topic. Some people may try and write it off as something that is a formality. Uh, These are the technical details that elders need to be thinking of. But we live in a day and age that is ravaged by the prosperity gospel and false prophets and self-ordained, as it were, men, men who just think, oh, I have uh, the desire that's spoken of, and therefore I have to go out. Uh, but Self-appointed, self-ordained men. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and that's what we're trying to uh, really address, and even as the Apostle Paul speaks about as well. So uh, where do we really start with thinking about these things? Well, you nailed it, because there is... Uh, there is a sense in which we can be extreme on either side. We can go to one side, we'll talk about this later, but we can go to one side and say ordination isn't important at all, or we can swing to the other side and make so many stipulations and rules that no one can ever uh, attain to it. Look, the, the purpose of ordination is to identify a man who has been called into gospel ministry to identify a man who is qualified, and on the flip side, also to identify a man who is disqualified. He says, I want to be a pastor, I want to be an evangelist, a missionary, and through the ordination process, the church who recognizes this says, you know what, I think we're, we're seeing that you're called to something else. 
The word ordain is found in scripture. Certain translations may not use the word ordain. It might use the word the laying out of hands. It might say appointed, but it's the same idea. It's the idea of the church recognizing a man who has been called into gospel service. Let me read a few verses. One of them would be Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed, there it is, or ordained, elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Or over to Titus 1, verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains, and here it is, Paul is telling Titus to do this, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So there's the idea, the biblical idea. Now, it's important for us to remember that in a sense, the church doesn't ordain. God God calls people into gospel ministry. Acts 20, verse 28, it's the Holy Spirit that has made you overseers. Pay careful attention to yourself and to the flock, but remember, it's the Holy Spirit that made you overseers. Or in Ephesians 4, it's Christ that gave shepherds to the church. So Christ, the Holy Spirit, is the one who calls them, but it is the local church. And more specifically, the elders of the church who see this and then recognize that in a man and then lay on hands or ordain or appoint that man to gospel ministry. Mm, that's good, brother. So if it is that obvious in scripture, then surely everyone is for it. Everyone is on board and supports ordination. Is that what we tend to see? No, there are hazards. And it makes me think of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, remember, this is this is 19th century England, and he referred to ordination as uh, putting empty hands on empty heads. And sometimes people use that quote from Spurgeon and take it to mean that he was totally opposed to any kind of ordination. He wasn't. In the context, here he is in the uh, Anglican context. Remember that Spurgeon's a Baptist. He's a, he's a, a dissenter, he's a nonconformist, which means he's he's not in the milieu of the Church of England. And that's, again, that was one of the concerns of Rhenius. All of the stipulations of the Church of England that had all of these different rules, that's what Spurgeon was opposed to. So there are hazards. Let me give you a few that we should be careful of. The one is that we shouldn't discard ordination as unnecessary, double negative, which means It is necessary. Let's not go to the extreme. In fact, even Radius, which I mentioned before, he was greatly respected by one of my heroes, a great missionary of the faith, Norris Groves. Norris Groves came from the Brethren Church. And the Brethren, who have had a tremendous influence on missions, have a very informal view of church polity. Uh, They don't really have... Uh, technical uh, uh, pastors in the church. Uh, They just kind of come together and gather and kind of talk among each other, and they don't put a heavy emphasis on ordination. So we we shouldn't go to that extreme. We shouldn't say it's unnecessary. It is necessary, but let's make sure that we're following it according to what Scripture says. Another concern would be making sure that you don't ordain too quickly. And you mentioned Bodhi Reggie before, and wow, we were really, we really try to be careful with that. We've had a number of cases in our church where people were made members. We even try to take extra care there. And then after a certain amount of time, what happens? They fall away. And that really is sad and hurtful in the church. And so we really wanted to make sure that that, that isn't happening with the men that we ordained to be elders. We took time. This comes from 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 22, that says, don't lay hands on someone too quickly because if you see a man who says, I've always dreamed about being a pastor and you quickly lay your hands on him, another word saying, we approve of this and then he falls into sin and he falls away. The church in a sense carries some of that shame and carries some of that guilt. So we have to be careful. Number one, not to see it as unimportant. 
Number two, not to do it too quickly. Let me give you a third one. Uh, and that is, make sure that when you're ordaining, it is only men. Now, this is politically incorrect, but it's so obvious from Scripture. Just read First Timothy 2 and read the qualifications of a pastor in First Timothy 3. No, we do not lay hands ever on women to ordain them as pastors. And if your whole community or your whole culture or your whole denomination approves it, then you stand contra mundum against it and say, no, we can only approve what God approves. And God only approves men to stand as leaders in the church. So those would be some hazards. There's more, but those would be a few examples. That's helpful, brother, because I can see so many people just jumping the gun and being quick to solve the problems, especially in a missionary context where you don't have any readily available men. And it's, uh, there can be a temptation to be really quick to uh, lay hands, but Paul warns against that. And even uh, you see one from the, the perspective ordainees side and a warning there and a warning on the ordainer side. On one side, it's let not many of you be eager to teach because yes. there's a stricter judgment. Yes, James 3 1. Exactly. Good. How much stricter the judgment yes. when you're ordaining someone and saying, hey, we put our full faith behind you to be in this task. Well, let me throw it back to you because here you are, you have a great skill in all of your AV, uh, IT, technical work, videography, and yet I know of you personally that you have a great affection for God's word, a great affection for theology, a great affection for leadership in the church, a great affection for teaching and preaching. So let me ask this. Let's say you wanted to become an elder one day in the church. And let's say your desire would maybe not to be a full-time 50 to 60 hour a week preacher, but you wanted to be what we would say a lay elder. Mm. And that is you would put whatever, a dozen hours to the church per week uh, along with your other job. Should you be ordained for that as a, as a lay elder? Is this only for the Spurgeons? Is this only for the senior pastors? Or should all elders have a form of laying out of hands and ordaining? It should be there for all elders because you're going to be in a position where you're being an example to the sheep and the sheep are going to follow that example. Uh, there's no segregation of those who are ordained and not ordo- ordained or half ordained from the Apostle Paul. There's no pattern of that either. And you're going to be teaching God's word. And so if you're going to be an instructor, a leader, a shepherd, then uh, people are going to have to know that You've been approved by other men, as Paul requires. Well said. I agree. Mm. Let's move into a bit of the practical elements and the step-by-step process. How does one actually go about ordination? Okay, so let's just kind of break down some practical steps. And I would say the first one would be find a man that you can pour your life into as your Timothy. So even before you get to the formal process of the ordination exam or the laying out of hands, I would say find a man that you can pour your life into and don't put the pressure on yourself of, okay, now I'm formally getting this man ready for a nation. It might just mean I want to disciple him. And then as you disciple him, as time goes on, you're going to start seeing marks that like this guy has some real potential. So, I mean, we went, met Bodhi Reggie when he was 10 years old and yeah, when he's 13, we're not thinking this guy is the next pastor of our church. But as, as the years passed, we, we really started amping it up when it came to the amount of time that we put into him. That's what Paul did. I've read somewhere that Paul walked something like 9,000 miles in his journeys. And a lot of that was with Titus and with Timothy and um, Aristarchus and, and Epaphrodites and, and, um, and, and these, these other men that he poured his life into. And so do that. Drive in the car with him. Teach him. Uh, have discipleship lessons with him. Bring him into your home for family worship. Read theological books with him. And then eventually you'll find that 
this man may be called into pastoral service. And by the way, just because he doesn't initiate, it might be you who initiates it. Sometimes he's the last one to see it in himself. And in some ways, I kind of like that. Because again, you're, you're staying away from the self-appointed side. If the guy is too quick to appoint himself, I even think with Reggie, Reggie was fearful. Reggie was like, there, it, I think it was a good kind of fear. It was, it was a kind of respect to the office, not uh, I'm afraid that I'll make a, mis- make a mistake. It was, this is such a lofty office, I'm intimidated. And so we had to kind of push him through that, through the process. That would be step number one. Mm, and that's a good step. And I, I love what you're saying there. I was uh, looking at something the other time where a man was apprehensive about taking up some office. I think it was an office of king. And uh, this is not in the Bible, an, an office of king. And he's there like, but you know, I've never wanted this. And they say to him, that's exactly why you're mm-hmm. the right man for the job. Uh, just in that element of if someone is too quick to desire this, then there could be potential for uh, being puffed up by pride or other things that want to be avoided um, by people who are laying on hands. And just thinking of Reggie, in one of the photos that was floating around around the time of his ordination are from his young days where he's there uh, in that young frame of his where he hasn't put on much meat and it's just uh, the the big head and young Reggie over there. And then and I can say this stuff because he's my friend. Uh, and uh, another thing is that the day of his ordination was the 24th of March, 2024. Uh, we went to his house afterwards and I remember him showing me the book that he spoke to us about, his notebook. And the day he wrote down his salvation testimony was 2010, 24th of March, uh, almost like 14 years to the day, which just reflects the amount of pouring in that's gone in. And he went uh, from that young boy who has had all this theology and time, which you've been walking a road with him, getting to know him, uh, pouring into him. And that's just amazing, brother. What's the, the, the next step? And I even think about that with Saisani and Mukungu. It's like, these are young guys that have a lot of potential and they're up front and they're leading the services and the songs and the scripture reading and the prayers and all the time in the back of my mind, I'm not trying to pressure them or push them into something uh, haphazardly, but all the time I'm thinking, this could be the next pastor. This could be the next elder. I think that's healthy. A mm. uh, next step would be, now you want to notify the church. Let the church know, I am... I am considering X, Y, Z to be an elder in the church. I want you to take some time to think about this and to watch them. They might see some things in him that you can't see. They might come forward and say, he acts this way in front of you, but just so you know, behind the scenes, he's different. That's what you want to hear. You want to hear that from the church. So let the church know about these things. Third, the next would be assuming that they approve of it. You've located the man, the church approves it. Then next plan the ordination exam. And the exam is unique because now you're primarily testing his theological acumen, his understanding of the Bible. You've watched him for years by now. You've seen his life. You've seen his character. This is a chance to bring different men in to test him. So what we did in our particular setting, we're uh, a Baptist church and we're, we don't have a Presbytery. Pres, uh, Presbyterians would have a little bit more formal and uh, maybe complex, but we would just bring in of like-minded churches from other Baptist or Baptistic type churches. And we had about eight men on the panel and we asked him about a hundred questions and it would be theological, it would be exegetical, it would be practical, it would be spiritual, it would be personal holiness type questions. You you were there. In fact, you were even the clerk. And I think it was helpful because you recorded all of his uh, questions and answers. Can you tell us a little bit about how you did that? Now, I remember from my ordination, we had a clerk and of course, he was just writing it out by hand, I think it was. But you had a little bit more uh, detail and it was helpful. Walk us through that a little bit. You know, I remember back in high school when he'd, when we'd have exams and sometimes he'd have a three hour exam and Uh, you have to write a 300 word essay and you're writing and you feel like your wrist is on fire. So I can imagine what your clerk had to go through. Uh, And as I was planning out how to go about my duties, uh, the reason we're doing this once again is not because, or the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is not because uh, for some 
empty formality. There's a reason behind trying to be organized, and that's because we serve a God of order. First mm. Corinthians fourteen forty. Mm. Uh, our God is a God of order, so we want to do it with a couple of things in mind. We want to make sure that anyone who wants to revisit this, whether it's him, mm. uh, Reggie, wanting to see how he did, whether it's you or other pastors wanting to come back to him and say that, hey, your answer there can be sharpened up here uh, or can be bettered here because he's in no way the final product. Uh, he's he's uh, just uh, at a good point where people can get behind him and support mm. him. So I used a Google Sheets document online because most people are these days. It's able to be shared with people. I tried to capture the number of questions. I tried to capture the person who was asking the question. I tried to capture the uh, uh, the question itself. Then I tried to capture the answer, which I tried to pay a lot of a lot of detail to, so that he could actually reflect on how he was doing. A good tip you gave me was to show which ones he maybe struggled with or didn't do as well with, so that they can be revisited afterwards. I tried to capture some general minutes because um, we used a, a catechism to go through all these things. So as I'm capturing the general minutes, we're, we're capturing the topics by the side, whether it's creation or sovereignty or providence, so that anyone who looks back at this document can see that, okay, that's where we are, that's what was said, and that is what was done. Yeah, so we use the Baptist Confession of 1689 as kind of our template, as you mentioned, but of course, with the amount of time, I think it was three hours long, and we felt like <laughs> each chapter you're spending three minutes, you know, we're, we are able to ask, you know, tell us about the Protestant Reformation and uh, who is behind it and who is influential. That was one of our only church history questions. But in the end, we had about a hundred questions and you end up using all of your questions on what is inspiration and tell us about adoption and uh, what is your uh, millennial position. And when three hours is over, you think I could have asked another 500 questions, but one of the benefits of that exam is we actually had our church people there, right? They were sitting in the audience. They weren't allowed to ask questions, but they were sitting there and you had a lot of young men there as well who are sitting on and watching this and enjoying this and seeing this uh, man wrestling. He's got up front, he's sitting in a chair, has his Bible. We're not asking questions to trick him, uh, but we're asking him questions to legitimately showcase that he understands what the Bible says. Yes, and I think of what the experience was like for me, and I can imagine for the other pastors, because when you're there in that ordination exam, I think of it uh, how it's done with weddings as well, as, uh, at least where weddings are practiced well. People are there not just to have a good time, just to have a joy. They're there to be witnesses, to say that, hey, we're giving our approval here. And we are also going to uh, hold accountable this couple and the officiators there and everyone's there. So now Reggie has at least seven men who are in the wider area who can say, yes, I mm -hmm. know that pastor. I was mm -hmm. there at his ordination exam and the questions weren't extensive. You can't cover all aspects of theology, but it also did help, as you're saying, to uh, he he was apprehensive. He had a healthy amount of apprehension. And the exam helped him to show that, hey, look, you, you know what you're doing. You have a good starting point. And there are men here who are also believing in what you're doing. And it's like an, an accreditation uh, of sorts and a reflection of all those years that were poured into him. And even afterwards, when the exam was over, we took a little break and I sat privately with those men and I wanted everything to be in, open, in the open. I didn't want anyone to say you pushed them through. It, we sat down with just the men and I said, what did you think? Comments. Think you did a good job, Badger? Of course, they, oh, they did excellent and here are the comments. So again, it's open in front of the congregation. It's open questions in front of the pastors. You, you want it to be the elders who are pushing this along and leading it. But at the same time, you want some kind of affirmation from the local church. And that's the point of the ordination exam. And then the final one uh, would be the, the kind of the highlight. And that would be the capstone. That would be the ordination service where you're laying out of hands. Sometimes you'll have the man who will 
actually uh, preach a special sermon himself. In our case, we had a guest speaker, we had a choir, and then the guest speaker preached on uh, the importance of uh, being bound uh, to the brethren and being bound to the book. That was our good uh, friend, Pastor Joel Wegner. And then we brought him forth and we laid on hands. And then the following uh, Sunday, we had the vows where uh, I read items and he confirmed, I do, or I will, or yes, God help me. And then I gave vows actually to the congregation. They said, yes, we do. Uh, so God help us so that it was made clear. They have obligations. He has obligations. If there are ever is, if there's ever a case where you see you have broken your vows that you are responsible to tell the church. And if there is ever a case where you change your theological position to something wayward from the scriptures that your responsibility to come to us. So that really was kind of the capstone, the vows that were given. And so that's kind of just uh, an overview of, of ordination, all the way going back to the example of Rhenius in church history through the scriptures, and then kind of giving some practical ideas of the way to do it in your local church. Thank you, brother. That's very helpful. I can actually remember uh, when my wife and I were in Antioch, it's a much larger church. So even when members are being put up in preparation for being received into uh, membership, sorry, prospective members are being put up for preparation, they are put in the bulletin and people are told, if I remember it's a period of three months before the next members meeting, please have a look at this person, have a look at this person, get into their life, see if there's anything going on. And uh, then they're welcomed in at the next members meeting or at their baptism. Then when it comes to elders, it, there's a greater weight, elders or deacons. So it's not just three months, it's a much longer period. And I remember Antioch drilling in that, hey, with, with uh, this process, we're not just pulling a random man from the congregation. We're looking for someone who's already been doing these things. He's already been practicing the shepherding work without being asked to. So you're speaking about men being invested in. And then when it comes to the, the, the final stage and they're put before the church and the importance of the vows, it's such a wonderful occasion to behold. And, and, that, and what yeah. that does is it, when you go through that process, it, it protects the church. There's always going to be excommunications. There's always going to be church discipline, but you, you want to lower that as much as possible. So the more you vet and the more you analyze and the more you research the character, the less that's going to happen and the healthier that's going to be for the local church. Mm. For some closing words, brother, would you mind just giving a word about how common or rare ordination services are in our day and uh, a, a, a last final push for why uh, the church should be thinking about these and even the ordination exam and the important role they play. I would love to see churches, especially in our kind of orbit, Reformed Baptist churches, to do this more frequently. And I've, I actually flew back to the U.S. specifically to be a part of an ordination council uh, back at a partnering church. And I thought that was great, but it's been rare that I've been a part of these. And as I reached out to other pastors, even pastors who sat on the, the panel or reached out to other men who I respected, this is not a common thing. Uh, I didn't hear anyone say, we're doing this all the time. Now, of course, there's going to be some strong churches that do that. But overall, my takeaway was, this is, this is unusual, uh, at least going to this extent. They might say, okay, this man's call, you know, we'll have a service where we land of hands. But actually going through the process, the ordination exam, notifying the church, the vows, laying out of hands, all of that, I would love to see a little bit more of a robust formal activity of following uh, the dictates of Titus 1 verse 5. And I think in the end, that's going to make our churches healthier. And in the end, it's going to help the gospel uh, travel more powerfully throughout the world. What a treat, Mfundisi. To our audience, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to rate it and subscribe to keep posted with more upcoming content. Feel free to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting and submit any questions you may want answered in a future podcast. You can email those questions to paulschleyline at gmail.com. You can also visit betweentwocultures.com for other resources like this. I'm your host, Jamikani Katunga, and until next time, 
that's it from Missionary Minds.